Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to find the light. It's a It's okay, I'll do the intro real quick. Uh, hey everyone, welcome back to another session. Today we have Dr. Montero. She's from Australia, so the time difference is crazy, but we are so excited to have her because unique perspectives are always welcome and we're really excited to learn. So whenever you're ready, you can start. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I love that you guys are doing this. As I said, it's such a great resource to have for everyone who's going through COVID and not able to do shadowing. So I'm so happy to do it. Um, I am in the full Sydney lockdown currently. So it's good that I we have plenty of time to go through this. So um, just to kind of uh, talk about topics that I'm gonna discuss, I wanted to start off just with general skills with dentistry, um, things to look out for, things to kind of think about in terms of um, skill sets you'll need on a daily basis. Um, I wanted to focus mostly on what you guys would immediately be looking for in terms of resources and information to apply to dental school, kind of looking then at what dentistry would look like in terms of getting a job, applying to the dental force. So being a competitive applicant, getting the most out of dental school, and then what your options are. And I have just a few cases at the end that we can just go through as well. Um, so in terms of skills for dentistry, I really think that this dentist equals doctor plus engineer plus artist is an amazing way to summarize it. I really believe that you're looking at all three of those skill sets every day. Um, and it's a really good way to kind of summarize what interests you may have in the field and how it's applicable. Um, in general, day to day, anxiety management is definitely something that you're dealing with. So you have to understand that the majority of your patients are coming in with anxiety as an underlying situation. And so being able to manage that is extremely important. Um, I mentioned that communication, that's 99% of your job. So being a people person is extremely important. At the end of the day, when you think about it, when you're treating a patient and you're prepping that tooth or whatever you're doing, taking that impression, the patient has no idea the quality of your hand skills. The quality of your hand skills don't really come out until long-term success for the patient. They're not really aware of, oh, they're doing a great job and, and they're super dexterous and, and look at how amazing this margin looks on your prep. All they really know is how they feel, how comfortable you make them feel and how you're able to really manage their anxiety and what they need from you in the chair. So communication is huge. Um, and that goes hand in hand with building relationships, especially for you know general dentistry, you're seeing these patients very often. And so it's important to build relationships, even if you're a specialist and you're not seeing them as often, um, it's all part of the job. Um, detail oriented and dexterous is the next thing I mentioned. Um, dentistry inherently is very micro. Um, there are some specialties that can also be considered macro. Um, and I think that's kind of something you realize when you're in dental school. I mean, I've had colleagues who were aware that micro wasn't really their preference. So if you think of macro in terms of dentistry, you can think oral surgery or radiology, for example, it takes more of a less day-to-day -day dexterous stance in some aspects. Um, but either way, precision is always gonna be key. And something that I kind of realized afterwards um, it was based on a research project someone was doing. They were asking us all about hobbies that we had that would involve fine motor skills. And I thought that was really interesting because when I reflected back on things I did in my childhood and just hobbies I had in general, I did realize that I did have, you know, those kinds of things that I was interested in. So I wanted to bring it up because it's, I think, a good way to kind of test yourself and, and you know, kind of think about it and do different activities that might test your fine motor skills to see how you like it. Um, obviously, if you're thinking about dentistry, you're thinking about, I wanna work with my hands. So it's kind of goes with that. 
troubleshooting. Um, this is something my dad always talks about. He says, no two cases or patients are ever the same, which really is so true. You're never treating the same you know, patient in the same way, even if they have the same dental issues or, or you know, treatment involved. Um, it really keeps you on your toes and it definitely, I would never call dentistry mundane or you know, repetitive in any way. So that's something that's something I was looking for in my career. And holistic doctor. Um, I feel like holistic as a general term has been distorted quite a bit these days, um, but essentially holistic means whole body treating. So you are a doctor and a physician. And so you are treating each patient as a whole, not just their teeth or their gums or the head and neck. Um, I mean, you are seeing them, as I said, typically more often than their general physician. So there's a lot of areas in their lives that you might be picking up on changes or, or you know, medication differences, things like that, reactions that you need to pick up on and be aware of, um, whether it's part of your treatment plan or just your patient in general. So for me personally, I spend a lot of time talking to my patients about that when I first meet them and I'm going through their medical history. I try to ask them questions about what their day-to-day -day life looks like, you know, how they're coping and even asking them if they know why they're taking certain medications and what it's for and, and how they feel on it, things like that. And I've very, very often referred patients to other physicians that have nothing to do with dentistry, just because, you know, you might have an experience with a family member or a friend that can help them out. And that's all part of your scope in terms of being a doctor and a dentist. So a little bit about my background in education, as I said, I'm, I do have a bit of an unconventional background. So I um, grew up in Australia and I went to Sydney University for my undergrad. My majors were in gender studies and digital cultures, so non-science based. I had started with a double uh, major in science as well, but I ended up dropping it because I wanted my GPA to be exceptionally high to keep me competitive because in Australia, you didn't need a science degree to get into um, dentistry. You just had to do really well in the sciences in the exam, which I was confident in. So that was kind of a strategy for me. Um, and it did work really well to my benefit. Then when I uh, moved to the States, I did uh, my pre-dental studies at University of Miami. And then I went to the uh, Midwestern University for dental school um, in Arizona specifically, because they also have a campus in Illinois. Um, a bit about my family background. I'm actually a third generation dentist. My father's a professor of ortho at Sydney Uni. So he's the Dean of Ortho there. Um, and my mother is a pediatric dentist and she also worked in the ortho department at Sydney Uni for, as an academic coordinator. Um, in terms of what I did to prepare to get to know the field before I started my studies, um, I worked with my father. He trained me as an orthodontic assistant, which is a little bit different than the US because you don't need formal training. So um, a dentist or a specialist can train you in their own way to be an assistant, however they like. You can also get formal training, but that's a little different in the US. Um, and then I also went on to do uh, general dental assisting for four years. So I did that concurrently with my undergraduate program. And then every chance I got, I was just networking with different specialists that my father worked with or my previous employer worked with. And I was just trying to get myself into every specialty that I could just to kind of link everything together, get a good understanding of how the dental field worked as a whole. So to be a competitive candidate, um, these are kind of four things that I've listed. In terms of grades and DAT score, this is not something I wanna focus too much on because at the end of the day, no one knows your best like you do. So if you were to take the DAT, you would know based on your score, hey, look, am I going to study more and do I think I can do better? And is that extra time or year gonna be beneficial to me, you know, taking that year to do that or, is it worth kind of financially investing in doing some applications and going through that application process and seeing how it goes? So that's really a very personal decision. 
um, in terms of study prep, Crack the Dat was amazing. It really much simulates the actual exam itself um, because it's all online software. So that helped me tremendously. I even used the Crack the Boards system for my part one and two boards in dental school. And I loved it. It was by far the best thing that I used to study for. Experience is basically kind of what we're involved in now in terms of shadowing. So I know that with COVID, it's really, really hard. Um, so I can understand that that's frustrating, but what I always tell anyone who asks in terms of, even when I was in California, I had a pre-dental student shadowing me and I told him that the best way to be competitive is to have hands-on experience. Being an assistant as an undergraduate student in the US I know is tricky, but the way that I kind of found that we were able to overcome that was that I actually referred him to a volunteering organization in our area in the Bay that was able to take him on a few days a week so that he was able to have hands-on experience. Because when you're just shadowing, since you're not doing it physically yourself, it's really hard to be responsible for I guess the workflow and really investing yourself in the workflow and being able to ask very specific questions. Whereas if you're volunteering, for example, you may even be able to assist, but even if you were to be working in the lab, pouring up models, mixing alginate, whatever it may be, writing up lab slips, all of that really does set you apart. And it's especially important for, I wrote interview topics and discussions, but also I found that the people in my class among my colleagues that were especially competitive were people who had either been assistants in the past or they were hygienists that decided to go into dental school. This was really apparent, especially in our second year when we started doing a lot of dental content where once we had done basic sciences, it just helps you string together the concepts so much easier. You've seen it before, you've worked with it before, you kind of know a lot of what's going on and so it really sets you apart but initially even with interview topics and personal statements it's so so helpful because for example for my personal statement I started off the first paragraph with pulling the audience in with an anecdote that I had from assisting you know an interaction I had with a patient that I thought was really memorable and that really impacted me and my experience and when you have to think that these people are reading thousands and hundreds and thousands of, of these applicants and, and applications and personal statements. And if it's really stock standard, like I had braces as a child and I thought that was cool and, and I liked going to the dentist, that's a lot of people's story. So you really want to kind of have an experience that sets you apart in that way. Um, LinkedIn is also really, really good in terms of a fantastic networking tool. Um, I think I made a LinkedIn as early as undergrad um, because when I started applying for different schools, I actually went and started following those, you know, schools, the dental schools and undergraduate programs um, on LinkedIn, which then kind of refers you to a lot of professors, dental professors, but also a lot of dental students. So you can actually then directly message these people and ask them, hey, look, you know, I have some questions about your program or would you mind sitting down with me for an hour or two so I can pick your brain about something? And then even if you were to be interviewing at a particular school, you can then shoot them an email, like a message through LinkedIn and, and say like, thank you so much. I mean, you're writing letters and, and sending emails to particular interviewers as well, but it's such a great networking tool. And then you kind of present yourself professionally from an early you know, stage, and you can classify yourself as a candidate for, you know, a pre-dental candidate or, you know, whatever it is. But that networking is really, really beneficial. It really opens up some doors and gets some communication going. And again, if you're reaching out to someone who's an interviewer or a professor, you're standing out in, immediately. So um, selecting a dental school. In terms of um, what you really want to get out of your experience, 
that's something that you should really start thinking about and researching, obviously, early on um, to get to know the institutions. And a lot of this is about creating agency and, and getting out of it what you want. Um, for me, clinical confidence was the most important thing. And the reason for that was because when I was talking to my father's postgraduate students, I was asking them very often, what did you like about your dental school? And what did you feel like you were lacking or you wished you had? And unfortunately, pretty much all of them said, I was not confident when I graduated dental school. I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. And a lot of the times people rely on assistants who have been in the field for 10, 20, 30 years to guide them through procedures. And I thought, that sounds terrible. I really don't want to be in a situation where I don't feel confident in my skills, having spent four years intensively studying dentistry. And also after, you know, that much debt as well, you want to get what your four years are worth. So for me, the clinical confidence and the requirements for each school was really important. Um, you also want to think about specializing in research. I'll kind of go into that more later as well. But Essentially, whether the school has a specialty program or not is going to impact your general dental experience quite a bit. So you want to have an idea of, do I want to look for a school that's that's got a, a specialty program I'm interested in to be able to maybe have like a transfer type of a situation when you apply? Or do you want to be able to see all of those cases that the specialty residents would typically see? If the school doesn't have specialty programs and obviously there are some schools that are very very heavy into research and so if you do want to definitely specialize that might be a preference for you as well um, loans and finances is i would say it's a consideration for me it wasn't a huge consideration because i either way you're coming out with a lot of debt but you may want to also think about okay well if I'm choosing a school that has a higher tuition rate what's the cost of living like how much am I going to have to take out to live there comfortably and that might kind of steer you in a particular direction as well um, workflow entry is kind of discussing or thinking about you know am I do I have an idea of what the work force looks like after I graduate? Do I know where I want to relocate to? If so, kind of start networking before dental school. Am I thinking of residency? Typically people don't think of residency until their fourth year, I would say. So maybe not so much. Um, and just as a general experience, I would ignore rankings. I, I was very heavily focused on rankings when I was applying, but I found that when I started talking to a lot of um, dental students or dental graduates after I had been through the whole program, it did not matter where they went or what the ranking of their school was. There was a lot of people that went to Ivy League dental schools or schools that were ranked very highly that had very little confidence graduating compared to, for example, Midwestern that was a newer program that wasn't really on the radar in terms of rankings and that I felt extremely confident graduating from. So I wouldn't pay too much attention on that. Um, in terms of what I'm passionate about, uh, cosmetic and restorative dentistry is a huge for me. I, I absolutely adore that. That's my that's my main passion. Orthodontics, implant placement, restoration, and um, I've done further uh, studies in cosmetic Botox and filler as well. So that kind of is goes hand in hand with cosmetic dentistry. So dental school. In terms of why I chose Midwestern, now obviously I'm very biased and um, I absolutely loved the Midwestern Arizona program. I have almost nothing negative to say about it. It was fantastic. Um, everyone that I come across, I tell them to apply. Um, what stood out to me is the clinical experience. Basically, a lot of schools will have um, requirements and they'll say, okay, by the end of the, your fourth year, you have had to do this many extractions, cut this many crowns, do this many fillings. And Midwestern does not have any requirements. And the reason is because they blow them out of the water every time. Average for the US and many other countries, the average dental student graduates having prepped 
four crowns. Now, that sounds kind of brightening because four is nothing. How are you meant to be an expert at something after having done it four times? You really aren't. Um, when I graduated, the average for our cohort was, I think 80 crowns were prepped per person. So that's why we don't have requirements because they just blow them out of the water. It is totally up to you in terms of how much you wanna challenge yourself. Also dependent on what your patient pool needs, but we'll kind of go into that later. Um, CAD CAM experience. Midwestern is really, really in the forefront of digital dentistry. They do have, they're even printing their own dentures now, um, but essentially this is all part of same day dental treatment um, procedures. So crowns, same day, inlays and onlays, things like that. Um, and Midwestern is a private institution. So in terms of tech, they have it all. Everything is high end. Everything is state of the art. If it exists, they have it. It's everything is at your disposal, which is fantastic because you're not, you know, going out into the workforce and finding new tech that you don't know how to use. It's very much something that you're exposed to very early on. Um, cosmetic cases are typically not something that you find people have a lot of experience with typically in general dental programs, but because of the way that the curriculum is structured, I actually did have a lot of experience with cosmetic cases and that was fantastic. Um, independence and timing is also a huge one because the professor to student ratio is fantastic. I think, I don't remember exactly what it is, but a lot of dental schools have one professor for every 20 students or something. So it, they've, it's difficult for them to supervise that many people efficiently where students aren't waiting copious amounts of time for things to get checked and verified and for them to be able to move on with the procedure. That's not the case with Midwestern. It's very, very efficient because our um, ratio is very low. And so I think it's one to six. I may, it, I may be mistaken, but it's, it's definitely a more personalized one-on-one -on -one experience. Um, it also has no specialty programs. This was huge for me because as soon as a dental school has a specialty program, you have to think that any patient that needs a specific specialty procedure, for example, let's say oral surgery, patient needs oral surgery, that patient, that procedure is going straight to the specialty residence. You're not really going to see or experience that procedure as much, whereas Midwestern, you're literally doing everything. There's a whole floor dedicated to specialty where all the faculty members are there. Every single specialty is there and you go take your patient, go down to that specialty department and you're able to treat your patient with whatever procedure that they need. Um, that for me was huge because especially even if you're thinking of specializing, how are you meant to know really how much you like that specialty if you've really not experienced those procedures? Um, I think it makes you a much better general dentist all round because then you can cater yourself to, okay, you know what? I, I really like perio, let's say gum surgery. I wanna take more courses on that and, and be as good as a specialist and be able to provide that service for my patients. Same with ortho, OS, whatever it may be. Um, so I found that very, very beneficial. Again, with specializing or not, um, the reason I say to really try to delve into it early on, it's really more trying to gather as much information as possible because you do have specific requirements. So I think you have to be in the top five or 10% of your class. So grades are a big component of that. Then you have to take a GRE and you have to do a lot of research. So you wanna be able to know whether you're gonna start doing research early on so you can plan accordingly with your schedule during dental school. Um, and then it might impact which school you choose to go to for general dental because a lot of you know specialty programs like to grab students from their general program to be able to go into their specialty program. So if you, if you like a particular specialty, then focusing on those dental schools that ha have that already might be a good idea for you. Um, some of the pros and cons in terms of thinking about specialty is 
essentially when you're specializing, you, you're niching yourself into a particular procedure or set, set of procedures, which means that you can't really divert back and broaden your scope afterwards. So if you're ortho, you can't go back and say, oh, I want to do veneers as well. You, you're no longer capable of, of doing those procedures legally. So that's why general dentistry allows for you to niche yourself into whatever group of specialties that you would like to focus on. Um, at the same time, your earning potential is a lot higher with specialty because you're basically taking on the extra risk, which means that, for example, as a general dentist, I might look at an ortho case or an extraction and say, yep, I'm not touching that. That looks complex. I can see risk involved. I can see where this can turn, you know, into a really complicated procedure. And so then that's when I refer to specialty because I don't want to touch it. So as a specialist, you're taking on that extra risk, but obviously you're being compensated for that as well. Okay, so this is what the inside of the Midwestern Arizona clinic looks like, the dental clinic. Um, it's beautiful. Um, it's uh, basically set up into uh, groups of operatories. So we have suites from A to, I think it's I, and each suite has a chief faculty member that oversees everyone. And then three floating faculty members that go around and are responsible for, you know, also checking on everyone, but they rotate, which means you're constantly getting new faculty members I don't remember how often, but every semester or something. So you experience a lot of different types of dentistry because you put 10 dentists in a room and give them a treatment plan or a patient and they will treatment plan it 10 different ways with 10 different philosophies. And it's, it's very diverse in that way. But having that experience of getting to know the variations of how you can do things is very beneficial. So by having faculty members come through your suite, you're constantly learning new techniques, new ways to do things, new equipments, new, you know, all of it. It's, it's so diverse and it's so, so beneficial. Um, essentially, you can see that there are two students per operatory. I'll go into that a little bit more coming up, but essentially it's a D3 and a D4, a third year and a fourth year student working together in a mentor mentee capacity. And the uh, professors in the background that have the teal uh, gowns are the, the ones that rotate. So they go around. And as you can see, everything is super high tech. Um, you have your screen, you can, there's a screen in front of the patient's chair as well that you can put you know, up their x-rays and, and really go through and educate them and everything. And each pair gets assigned an operatory, which is, not the case in all dental schools. So sometimes you are fighting for a chair, you're waking up at 5 a.m., you're going to the clinic, you're fighting for a chair to get a patient, to get a procedure that you've never seen before, you don't know what it is. It, 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 there are programs that are like that. In this case, it's not that way at all. You're guaranteed a chair, you're guaranteed a time, you're full-time in the clinic in your last two years, you're there to do the dentistry. This is kind of just um, what the general campus looks like in Arizona. Um, it's again, it's beautiful, it's state of the art, it's brand new, everything is great. And then this is what the dental building looks like. So Glendale Hall is um, where the simulation clinic is. Again, everything is so state of the art. I mean, you can see on this lower left-hand photo, basically you've got these benches and then everyone has their own screen so they can see exactly what the professor at the front is doing because they are recording everything and everything is being put on the screens. So you're watching procedures, you're watching demonstrations of, of whatever you're doing that day, the project or whatever it is. Um, you have basically all the equipment you would possibly want. And as I said, everything is super high tech. There's iPods on the Dexter units, like the fake humans. It's, it's extremely high tech. Everything is there. They do not, you know, I don't even know how to say it. They don't, they don't spare any expense. It's all there for you and it's all to your benefit. So this is kind of a general 
idea of how all four years are categorized and and I thought I would throw this in there just to I don't know how people are talking about this or how readily available this information is when you're applying to dental school um but basically your first year your d1 year you're doing basic sciences um it's grueling it's very grueling um you do a little bit of basic dentistry at midwestern but i don't know if that's the case for all schools and from day one you're in the sim clinic a lot of other schools start their simulation clinic a lot later but day one you're already in there you're already starting with the equipment you're drilling you're waxing up you're doing it all um the difference with Midwestern that is so beneficial is that you're taking part one of your boards, which is all based on basic sciences after your first year in your summer. This is not the case everywhere else. Typically they make you wait till the end of your second year. The problem with that being you just spent a whole year doing dental curriculum and you haven't even touched on basic sciences. And now you're having to go back and relearn everything you learned in your first year, which is an overwhelming amount of information to take an exam on it. And it's, it just makes no sense to me. I don't know why they do it that way, but it's amazing that it's offered right after you finished all the basic sciences in your first year, you get it out of the way. If there's a circumstance where you don't pass that time, you also have plenty of time to take the exam again before you're even looking at clinical work or anything like that, which may not be the case if you're taking it at the end of your second year. Um, D2 year is all dental curriculum stuff. Um, it's very heavy simulation clinic as well. First two years, you're also doing rotations in the clinic across the street in the dental clinic itself, um, where you're doing hygiene stuff, um, head and neck exams, things like that. So you're definitely still working with patients. Um, white coat ceremony is just transferring across to the clinic. And then they started this right in our year Basically, part two of your boards, which is how you get your license, has a component for the simulation clinic where you're having to prep teeth, prep plastic teeth back in like you were in, in your first and second year. However, by the end of your fourth, fourth year, you haven't touched a plastic tooth and it is definitely much harder than prepping actual teeth in patients' mouths. Um, one small little error, half a millimeter of discrepancy on a plastic tooth will can fail you. So I found that it was so bothersome to have to go and practice on plastic teeth after having treated patients. And so they started offering that component at the end of, of the second year. And I think they've had an, an incredible success rate. I mean, I think it's like 99% of people are just like passing so easily because you've been doing that for the last two years so super simple um d3 year is when you go into the clinic full time i don't know many other dental schools who do this where they have monday to friday you're in there doing your thing you have a full schedule you're not fighting for patients i feel like that's pretty rare um, we had one day of lectures during that time and that's when they start offering you mission trips as well, where you can go abroad, or I think they have a few in the US as well. Um, I personally went to Tonga for a week and it was fantastic. It was such an amazing experience. So I really recommend that too, if, it, if it's offered. Um, your final year, you're full-time in the clinic, you have half a day of lectures. That's when you're taking your second part of board. So it has a written component, which is again, software simulated. And then um, the clinical part, which is a patient portion. Um, and that exam is based on where you're planning on practicing because different states are grouped into different exams. And so you do have to make a decision as to which states you're thinking that you will practice in so that you can pick the correct exam to take at that time, which can be pretty stressful because if you don't really know or you're flexible, then there are people who take like REB and ADEX because they want to have the option and they're not quite sure, but it, it, it is pretty full on in that case to be doing that. So this is kind of the main differences in the curriculum that I think are really important to watch out for. And also things that you can definitely inquire about the clinic and ask questions about in your interview. But if you know, you have to know what to ask. So this is just a photo of me and my 
fantastic partner, Chelsea. Um, so when I first started in the clinic, I was a D3. She was my D4. It's a partnership. So you're together for two full years, or oh, well, for one year, and then you have a different partner when you become a D4. Um, you're umbilically bound to them. Um, essentially, they are like your personal professor because you starting off at the clinic, um, initially they may be doing more of the procedures and at that time you're their assistant. So you switch on and off who is the doctor and who is the assistant. There are a lot of dental schools where you don't have an assistant. They're not hire the dental school is not going to hire an assistant for you. Typically, um, you have to be your own assistant, and that's really difficult to be able to treat a patient when you're not familiar with the procedure or you're learning the procedure and have to assist yourself is really not easy. So, essentially, your mentor is assisting you, or you're assisting your mentor, and at the same time, that teaches you a very valuable lesson in terms of assisting because when you're going to go into the workforce, you're going to have to train an assistant. It's incredibly valuable for you to know what kind of skills they need and what you expect of them. So if that's expected of you, you're going to be able to train someone very easily. Um, and then, you know, while you're assisting and watching your mentor through these procedures, or if they're assisting you, you're constantly checking each other. So there's constantly four sets of eyes, looking at what's happening, making sure everything is good. Um, and then, plus you have your professor who's coming in and checking and helping you as well. So it's a constant discussion. It's constantly learning and, and playing off each other. And very often, I mean, you're both coming in with different perspectives, different skill sets, different backgrounds that really you know, compensate for one another. Um, the curriculum in the clinic at Midwestern is based on a private practice model. So essentially as a pair, as I said, you get a chair, you get an operatory and you get to dictate your own schedule. You're literally working as if you would be working in a private practice. Each suite or bundle of, I think it's 12 ops, which is from A to I, get a hygienist. And that is also not very typical. Um, to, it's very often that dental students are doing their own hygiene on their patients, which if you think about it, you are not in dental school to become a hygienist. You're there to do dental procedures. So the fact that you have to do those procedures is really taking away from your learning and your time um, putting into procedures that you should be doing for you know, your job. So the fact that they have hygienists there and they're not students, they're actual hygienists. And they work alongside you. And we had, for example, a patient pool of about 150 patients, three quarters of which were in recare or in a hygiene schedule. So they didn't have active treatment. Um, what that meant was we were scheduling them with the hygienist. And just as you would in a private practice, you have your columns of treatment for yourself. And then you have your hygiene columns where you're jumping in and doing exams for those patients who are on recare and, and being seen by your hygienist. So we did the exact same thing in school for two years. We had our hygienist and we would go in and check up on patients. Professor would come in, make sure we didn't miss anything. And we would go back to our regular schedule. That was so beneficial to us. The fact that we didn't have to do cleanings or deep cleanings or anything like that. It was an amazing way to transition into private practice. Um, again, as I kind of discussed, we have a whole level of specialty teams. Um, it was very rare, I would say, that a faculty member on a specialty on the specialty team would tell you that you weren't able to do a procedure. It was really based on, you know, if you did your research and you sat down and really studied for a procedure, even if it was a complex case. If you sat down with that professor before the day of the procedure and said, hey, look, I really want to do this and I'm really interested in this. Um, can we please work through it together? I've never experienced a professor turn a Midwestern student down because they know what they're capable of. If they show initiative and if they show that they've planned for that, they will by all means say, yep, let's do it. I'll assist you or I'll be there at whatever capacity you need me to. Whereas at a lot of other dental schools, there's definitely the mentality of 
I don't think you know anything <laughs> and you're not ready to do this. Therefore, I will not let you touch it. Um, and that also comes down to a, I guess, how they treat the students. Um, at Midwestern, I found that they treated you like a doctor. They treated you like a dentist. They respected you and they were aware of what you were capable of. And we built very close relationships with our faculty members. And they knew when they felt like you needed help, when they should step in, and when they trusted you to say, hey, look, you've got this, go for it. And I felt that was an incredible opportunity and privilege to have. Um, as I said, you control your own schedule. So when your patient comes in, you decide how many fillings you want to do on them. If you want to do multiple procedures, how many times you want to see them for checkups afterwards, all of these things you schedule yourself, which means you're seeing the same patients again and again, you're tracking their progress. They're getting to know you, they trust you. If you're at a school where you don't have that kind of a system, you might be doing a root canal on a patient and never finishing the crown on that tooth. There's no, there may not be that continuity or you're seeing a patient for the first time. They, they're even more anxious because they don't know who you are or what you're capable of. So in this case, your patients know what you're capable of. So they feel better. You build relationships with them. It's exactly like private practice. And I mentioned you're not doing hygiene, which is amazing. So then you've graduated dental school. You're now going to apply to find a job. Um, what do you kind of need to focus on? So I tell so many people this, that confidence is not arrogance. You need to know your value and your worth. And it's competitive out there. You need to be able to coming out of dental school, show employees and companies that, look, this is what I'm capable of doing. Um, and you have to have autonomy there. Um, a lot of people have that perception of, oh, you just graduated, you don't know anything. I don't trust your skills. Um, I'm gonna have to baby you, or they make very certain assumptions, let's say. Um, so confidence is not arrogance. Um, graphic CVs and resumes, I think, are very beneficial. Um, it's, I'm going to show you an example of what mine looked like at the time. Um, but essentially, the aim of the game is to stand out. You want to be unique. You want to be surprising in terms of how things look, how they're presented, so that you stick into someone's head and, and you're, you, know, you stand out. Um, cover letter, and then letters of reference. With letters of reference, I would say a minimum of three. We kind of talked about cover letter already, so I won't go into that too much. Um, but letters of reference, I know it's difficult to build strong relationships with faculty members right now if, if uh, students are doing a lot of online kind of education. However, I do feel, I wanna say confidently that by the time this cohort of pre-dental students go into a dental program, I think it'll be much more quote unquote normal in terms of you will be face to face and we'll have those opportunities. Um, but I mean, I would ask faculty members to go to lunch with me. I would ask them if I could buy them lunch. Hey, can I pick your brain? Or if I had, you know, a hole in my schedule or someone canceled or no showed or whatever it was, I would literally find a faculty member, sit down with them and say, hey, I have, I have like a bunch of questions. Do you think I could pick your brain? And I would literally have a Word document with questions on it. And I would be taking notes and writing everything down and A, getting to know them and also their experience. Everyone's experience is so different. Whether you find a faculty member that has practiced in an area that you're interested in, in working in or living in, or if they have you know, a niche procedure or something that you're interested in get to know them you it's so beneficial in terms of networking and, and you never know where that'll lead they might say like oh I, I have a friend who's retiring I know you're interested in in buying a practice in this area let me refer you to them whatever it is um, but letters of reference you don't want them to be generic you want that faculty member to really know you and be genuine about about what they have to say about you Clinical portfolio is 
something that wasn't really around when I was doing mine. Um, so it was something that kind of started, I think Midwestern started doing it um, with students the year after I left. So they, they were making it a lot more like standardized. But essentially, I since I didn't know if I was going to stay in the US or if I was going to go back to Australia, I wanted to have some kind of evidence or proof of, hey, look, this is what I've done. This is what I've achieved in my time there. This is the experience that I have. And this is what my clinical work looks like. And that was really important to me. So I started, you know, doing that very early on in whenever I started seeing patients in D3. And I'm also into photography. So dental photography is something I was, I was really interested in. And it was, we had all the cameras there. It was very easy for us to be able to document everything. But apart from it being a clinical portfolio, what it's extremely beneficial for is critically evaluating your work. Because when you're documenting everything, taking x-rays of everything, taking intraoral photos, you, when you look back at it, you're seeing it through a different lens and you're able to critique yourself in a way that you wouldn't really do if you didn't have that documentation. So for me, especially with cosmetic dentistry, because I loved that and I was passionate about that, taking photos of everything meant that I could go back and look and say, you know, oh, if I was to do this again, you know what, I would, I would use this technique or I would change this proportion or this shade I would do differently or this material I would use differently, whatever it was, I was able to be critical of my own work and make me better and, and make me hone in on those details to improve. So that's, that was super, super helpful. So this is kind of what my graphic CV looked like. It looks very different now, but at the time, this is what it looked like. Um, essentially, I started off with my clinical experience. That's what you want to boast about. You want to tell them, look at everything that I have done. I am confident in myself. These are my stats. Because for me, that's what stood out when I was being compared to other students who had done four crowns and I had done 100. That's something that you can very, very confidently talk about. Um, I have awards on there, organizations that I was part of, uh, volunteering things, and then employment, continuing education. I very much was um, trying to take as much CE as possible uh, before I graduated, just to kind of get your feet wet, kind of go out and and you know, mingle with dentists and, and go and, and see what's going on, get an idea of where you want to be, what kind of dentist you want to be. It's, you're just, in, you're a sponge. You're just taking in so much. And I mean, if you're obsessed with dentistry, it's just so fun. So that's what that looks like. This is kind of um, what my cover letter layout was like and what um, a letter of reference would look like, obviously without the text. And then this was my clinical portfolio. So essentially I started off with a full mouth rehab case that I did. I have some fillings, some direct composites, which was a little bit of cosmetic stuff. Um, but yeah, you can see it's very clear. I wrote down everything that we achieved, what we did. And so it gives your employer or anyone a really good idea of what you're capable of some root canals, some um, implant crowns and bridges, some separate crowns, whether they were lab crowns or um, CAD CAM crowns, same day crowns in the clinic. Extractions, um, implants is another huge thing. I mean, I obviously I'm not up to date with all the curriculums right now, but at the time I did not know any other dental school that was allowing for dental students to place implants. Um, at Midwestern, they have a association with an implant company called Bicon, which is a very unique uh, type of implant. But nevertheless, the actual procedure of placing an implant is very, very similar. But essentially, at the time that I was there, we were each given two implants to place um, on our patient pool. Uh, for the patient, it was free and the crowns were free as well, I believe. So. I think from what I've heard now, each student is able to place four implants each. Having said that, I had some classmates who either their patient pool needed a lot of implants or they specifically sought out that procedure and they knew they wanted 
to place implants right after they left school. I think someone in my class placed like 70 implants in, in two years. So, and now they're doing like zygomatic implants and all on fours and they're, they're only doing implants basically. So you can really tailor your experience to what you want to get out of it. For me, I also, since I was interested in ortho, I was able to do a full ortho case, which is also haven't heard of any general dental programs offering that. And you had flexibility there as well, because if you didn't particularly want to do a case from start to finish, which is a pretty lengthy process, um, you could opt to do a two week ortho rotation during a period of time um, in your final year instead of having that track. So I didn't, I, I think I did both actually. I think I did the two week rotation and the case because I was interested in ortho. So now a little bit about the dental workforce. So basically these are kind of options that you have to go into once you've graduated. The first is private practice. So as a new grad, you can go into a private practice and be an associate, an associate or an independent contractor, which means that essentially the doctor who owns the practice gets to a point where they say, okay, I'm so busy that I need a second set of hands. Typically, you have to think that they're still going to take on the big cases, the complex cases, the cosmetic cases, procedures that are more complex and be your mentor um, and give you more bread and butter dentistry. So sometimes depending on the circumstance, this might lead to a buyout opportunity where um, let's say if you work with that dentist for a long period of time, or you have uh, that conversation early on that the dentist will eventually retire and sell you the practice, then you would take on that practice and the patient pool that you've already been working with. That's a great situation to be in. Um, so that can be the case. Or, you know, they just need, they don't intend on selling you the practice. They just need help. It really depends. There's, there's all kinds of opportunities in private practice out there. Um, contracts, uh, just to touch on it lightly, Typically it's a tier system. So you'll be incentivized. So typically there's three tiers and let's say they, they tell you, okay, your goal for the month is this much production. And I will, if you hit that production goal, then I'll pay you, let's say 25%. Um, and then the next tier up is, okay, at this goal, I'll pay you 27%. And at this goal, I'll pay you 30%. So and those, each of those tiers might be incentivized with something else, whether it's Google reviews um, or what else? Different, it, it really depends on them. They can tailor it however, however they want to. Um, lab fees typically will be partially covered by your owner doc. Sometimes you have to pay them in full. Um, and benefits really depends on that owner. Typically, if they only own one practice, you're not looking at getting very many benefits, if any at all. Um, the second option is DSOs or corporate dentistry. Um, in this circumstance, you can go in as an associate. Uh, sometimes you go in as the solo doctor for an office. Um, other times you go in and you can buy shares into that organization and become a partner. Um, or you own the office and you work with them as a partner. So they take care of all the finances and you just take care of the dentistry type of thing but they're still incentivizing you in different ways. It's kind of tricky to talk about because there's a lot going on with the DSOs um, and they will definitely charm you and take you places and pay for things and they want you working for them. Um, but you have to think it's like working for any big corporation. It's a business at the end of the day. So, um, you have to consider that they are incentivizing you. They want you to do X amount of procedures a month or certain types of procedures. You might be kind of directed or told that they want you to treatment plan a particular way, treat a particular way. And the caveat there is that I always tell everyone at the end of the day, this is your license on the line. You have to make the decision as to what you allow yourself to 
be a part of and and kind of be flexible on and other things that you say I'm not okay with doing that or I don't think that this is the way that I want to treat patients or however it is but it's it's definitely you want to know what you're getting yourself into because I have some colleagues that absolutely love their opportunities at DSOs and are doing excellent work and have a really good relationship with the organization and are very prosperous and I have other colleagues who feel very very differently about it and don't like it or or end up working with them for a year and then saying no this is not for me I can't do this um, and then kind of do their own thing so just do a lot of research on what you're getting yourself into, into and making sure someone really reviews your contract because once you sign that contract, you are very much bound. Um, and, and a lot of DSOs will lock you in. So it won't be like a casual type of a situation. It will be, you have to work for me for a year, two years, whatever it is. Um, in terms of the contract, the tiers will be similar. Sometimes, I don't remember compared to a private practice model where their tier system is at, but very similar incentivized, um, but incentivized a lot strict, a lot stricter than I would say private practice. Um, typically they cover your lab fees. Some dental organizations even have uh, CE courses and things for their associates because they wanna make sure they prosper and essentially their aim is to make them into a partner. Um, so they, they do want to help you grow as well. Not all of them, but some of them do that. Um, benefits, that's, that's a major advantage is that because they're multi-million dollar corporations and organizations, they have the money to be able to offer you good benefits. Um, so if you're in a situation where you rely on that, then that might be a really good opportunity because you get dental, medical, whatever it is, time off, things like that. And then thirdly, practice ownership is essentially where I'm talking about, you know, you're graduating dental school and you're going out and you're saying, I'm going to buy a practice straight away, or I'm going to open a, a fresh new practice. Um, and with that obviously comes a business loan, uh, finances in terms of, are you, are you buying it outright? Are you taking over for someone else? Are you changing it at all? All those considerations. Also employees. You have to figure that people are going to call in sick. You have to deal with people not showing up and you have to accommodate for all of those things. So there are obviously a lot of stresses in that aspect as well. Um, I wrote up here also that uh, single private practice models are under jeopardy. And by that, I mean that with DSOs and corporate dental organizations, or even like multi, like small DSOs that have multiple practices or group practices, it very quickly can monopolize an area. So other private practices can definitely suffer because of that. Um, for example, the other thing is because they have so much financial freedom, they are able to get the highest quality tech companies, also dental equipment companies, give them a lot of bulk buying discounts. So because they're buying 20 chairs, they get like thousands of dollars off of each individual chair because of bulk buying. Whereas as a private practice, you're getting far higher fees. Um, and also, you know, a lot of dentistry is, is very, very tech savvy and it's, it's going into that direction. And that's very difficult for a single private practice owner to be able to afford hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of dental equipment in terms of if you want a scanner, a mill, a, an oven to be able to do same day dentistry, or you want a microscope for your root canals. Um, you have to buy digital x-rays, all of those things add up very quickly. And it's difficult for a single private practice owner to be able to pay those off. But for a DSO, super simple. So you're competing with that as well. So this is kind of a bit of what I've done. Um, I started off in Berkeley, California, in the Bay uh, with a company called Total Health Dental Care. Um, I was a an associate dentist that had a solo office. So I ran that office myself with a team of five um, and I was the only one there. So I had a lot of independence. Um, I was able to train the staff in a way that I wanted to, which was fantastic. Um, it gave me a lot of insight on how the business was run in, you know, 
a financial perspective and also in terms of everyone's role and how to train people and knowing how to train people. Um, what's really difficult is that when you graduate dental school, you don't graduate with a business degree. And yet you're kind of going into an industry where you essentially have to have knowledge and if you do want to be a private practice owner you're going to have to be a business owner and you may not have the skill set I definitely don't so it's something that you're going to have to either pay someone a lot of money for or you're going to have to trial and error and figure it out and there's I think the stats are like 50 percent of dentists get embezzled from practice managers and employees because they don't look at the finances and they just expect that other people are doing them correctly and it might not be the case and they get embezzled so you definitely have to decide how much you want to be involved in the finances of the business. And that can definitely stir, uh, gear you in a direction of, do I want to work for a DSO and not have to worry about it at all? Or am I going to take this on and be a private practice owner or be part of a group practice and have to be involved in, in the business? So in this circumstance with um, Total Health, it was a small DSO when I first started with them. They had seven practices. and a year and a half, almost two years later when I left, it was up to 16 practices. So within a very short amount of time, it had grown so much that it had essentially monopolized a lot of that area. Um, and the other way that it was advantageous for the patients was that we had a full specialty team within our organization. So we had root canal specialist, oral surgery, gum specialist, ortho. So we weren't referring out, which meant that everything was being kept in house. And it was very good for the patients because all the practices were 15, 20 minutes from each other, which meant that I was diagnosing something, referring to the specialist on our own team, I already knew exactly how they worked. I knew what they liked. I knew what information they needed. I could reassure the patient in telling them exactly how that specialist worked. And so it was very easy for them to go straight to another practice or stay in the same practice and have that treatment done. Um, another advantage is also that we had a call center and an insurance center. So typically within a private practice, the practice manager has to take care of setting up appointments for patients, calling them up and saying, hey, you're due for a hygiene appointment or following up with post-op you know, check-ins and saying, oh, how are you doing? You had this procedure, is everything okay? And then also when a patient is being seen, if they need any procedures, they have to contact their insurance, um, figure out what their you know, insurance is covering, write them up a treatment plan, all of those things in a DSO kind of business is being typically outsourced to someone else, which means that the practice manager can focus on making sure all the patients are comfortable, everything's running smoothly, everyone has what they need, that me as a doctor, I'm supported by her or him, um, and I can let them know if I need something or if I need them to do something. And so it takes that burden off of them and it makes the focus the patients. So that is a great service to be able to provide. Um, so yeah, workflow wise, it works really well. Uh, and then benefits, as I, as I mentioned, you definitely have benefits that are a huge plus. Um, in my position currently, so now I'm an associate dentist part of a single practice team. Um, it's, it's just one high-end practice. And we have an owner doc who is very much focused on surgical and implant dentistry. He's part of an a very elite association for all on four implants. Um, and he is a general dentist that has taken a lot of extracurricular uh, courses in implantology. Um, and so he has essentially specialized him, his own skill set into that within general dentistry. Um, he's absolutely fantastic. He's amazing at, at what he does. And so that means that as to keep his practice all rounded, I am one of three other associates that work with him. So we, we have one who comes in once a week who does ortho and she has her own private practice. And then she just comes in to, to treat some ortho cases at this practice. And then we have a second one who 
um, essentially does a lot of general dentistry and some surgical stuff as well. And then in, in my kind of niche, I'm focusing more on cosmetic dentistry and doing Invisalign and general restorative dentistry as well. So we all kind of work together to make sure we can offer the patients a, a wide variety of, of procedures. Um, and obviously then if we need to, we refer out to specialty. Um, in this case, for example, I am an independent contractor, which means benefits aren't really part of, of that conversation or the contract. Um, so this is uh, just my Instagram uh, page for my professional page. It just kind of gives you an idea of, of what I do. And I try to kind of post educational things on there and, and educate patients and also kind of give them different tips and tricks and, and show them like what we can do and, and things like that. Um, so this is kind of just where I'm delving into a few cases. So these are the results of same day crowns. So um, I'll kind of go into what a typical traditional crown workflow looks like, but essentially with the arrows, you can see where the crowns are and, and with how CAD CAM with same day dentistry, we can make them absolutely gorgeous and to the same standard as a lab crown in some circumstances. I don't do any um, same day CAD CAM crowns on anterior like front teeth that are cosmetic in nature or like a smile makeover, but there are some dentists who are really, really good at being able to make them look extremely aesthetic by taking a little bit longer and taking a few more steps. Um, but typically there are labs that have master ceramists who are laying porcelain. It's an incredibly like amazing skill set that they have to be able to do this, but they lay porcelain by hand. It takes a long time and you're paying a, quite a high lab fee for them to do each veneer or crown. Um, and that's what I prefer. The, that's just for my own skill set. Um, so yeah, these are all same day crowns. And this is kind of what the workflow looks like. So typically, let's talk about the traditional way of doing things. Typically you would be um, cutting a tooth or prepping a tooth, right? The patient comes in, you numb them, you prep the tooth, you then take impressions of that tooth to be able to send it to the lab. So goopy impressions with impression material, you have to take minimum of three if you get them on the first go, which sometimes if it's really difficult and there's a lot going on, you might have to take multiple. Um, and then you're preparing or creating a temporary crown to put on top of that tooth. Then the patient goes away in the, we have two weeks where they have a temporary crown on where that everything that gets sent to the lab, the lab manufactures the crown, they send the crown back. We get the patient back in the chair. Um, very typically we have to numb them. Sometimes you don't, but on average you do. Take the temporary crown off, put the crown on, see how it fits. There is a chance that something happened if there was distortion or whatever it may be, or maybe the shade is off, or it's not exactly how you want it to be. Um, Sometimes you have to send it back or if it doesn't seal the margin, the interface between the crown and the tooth, if there's a gap, you can't cement that crown. So then you have to put the temporary crown back on or make adjustments in however, whatever capacity you need to, take more impressions, send it off to the lab again, another two weeks, get the patient back in. That happens as well. It's, it's definitely something that isn't outside of the realm of possibility. It's not like you get it the first go. Um, so it is a back and forth, but minimum two appointments. And you have to numb the patient twice. If they already don't like injections, it's, you know, they have to kind of go through that. And the temporary crowns are finicky. They're temporary for a reason. They're not the best. Um, they can pop off. If they pop off, then you have to bring the patient back in to re-cement it temporarily. It's a pain for them and for you, especially if they have to take time off work or something, it might be frustrating for them. Um, with CAD CAM, digital dentistry, basically the workflow is like this. So you start off by scanning the teeth and, and the bite. Um, so upper, lower scans, and then they bite down and you scan how their teeth are coming together. 
you then prepare the tooth um, and when you're done preparing your tooth, you rescan the prep where the crown will go on top. So basically before you've prepped the tooth, when you're scanning it initially, you have an idea of what that tooth looks like already. So you can actually replicate what the tooth looks like in your crown identically. Um, and it gives you a really easy way of, of, you know, giving them exactly what they had, making sure they're comfortable. Um, after that, you are designing the crown. Now, this is, this is the part of the process where the engineering aspect of things is really beneficial because you, you're essentially designing it to exactly how you want the material thickness to be. You're choosing your material as it is, whether you want zirconia or Emacs, they're different porcelains and they have different strengths and, and you know pros and cons. Um, you're in control of how heavy you want them to bite on that tooth. You're in control of, do they have certain power functions such as like clenching and grinding? Do I have to be conscious of how I design this tooth based on what the other teeth look like? You can make all of those adjustments. Um, how heavy I want the flossing to be on either side of this crown. All of that is in your control. Um, once you've decided on your design, you pick the shade of the block that you want the crown to be in and you pop the block in the mill and you mill the crown. So then here you can see what that looks like, kind of uh, half milled. And then it pops off that little block and you put it in the oven. Um, and in that, before that process, you can actually customize the shade and stain that tooth however you want it. So in the previous, slide you can see for example in this middle photo the patient had a lot of decalcification on the incisal edges and cusp tips of their teeth so I was able to replicate that in the crown that I made for them so it blends really nicely so you can customize it in that way and once you fired it essentially it changes color to its final shade and it also is um, it optimizes its strength of the material and then you cement the crown so this whole process in terms of my workflow takes me two hours. So two hours versus two one hour or one and a half hour appointments over the span of three weeks or so is such an amazing service to be able to provide for the patient. They literally leave with the crown. I always tell them, look, you're numb. You know, there's a very, you know, there's a chance that what we've adjusted in terms of your bite might feel different once your numbing wears off. We might have to do some fine tuning, totally normal. I want you to be comfortable. I want it to be perfect. Come back if you need fine tuning and we'll adjust it when you're not numb so you can really feel and make sure that it feels comfortable to you. But it's patients love it. And they, when I'm done, they're like, I can't believe I have a crown. They expect to either, either have a temporary or, you know, and they're not in the chair for that long. And while that, while I'm um, designing and milling and, and firing and doing all of this in the lab, they're just chilling. They literally have about half an hour break time, um, half an hour, 45 minutes. Yeah. It depends on, on, you know, the, the day or, or the tooth, but they're not even in the chair with dental work happening in the mouth for this full two hours. So yeah, that's that's what that looks like. This is um, a case that I did on my um, very good friend. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to just cut you off, but um, you were just like, we're over time. So you just like, can you just wrap okay. it up? Like you're 15, 20 minutes more. Okay, wonderful. That's perfect timing mm -hmm. because this is the last case that I have. Um, so this is just a quick cosmetic case. Um, and yeah, basically here, it's just, it's just cosmetic dentistry. She had four veneers. She had laterals that were missing when she was born. So we replaced the veneers. We reproportioned everything. We gave her some canines. Um, and this is what the result looked like. And this is kind of, do you want me to go through this workflow? Or do you think we have time for that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but basically this is like the behind the scenes of getting ready for a cosmetic case like this. So um, essentially in the first appointment, we would be discussing the treatment options. In her case, she already had four veneers. You can kind of see that um, these, the first four teeth on the top, she's very petite. And so the proportions, because she was missing 
two teeth, they had to make each tooth wider and bigger. And so the proportions were just off. So when we were we discussed what we wanted to do to, to reproportion everything and, and fit her facial features more, we went with six veneers to be able to give us more room or per unit to be able to make each tooth smaller. So that's kind of the discussion you're having with the patient. The first thing you're doing then is taking impressions and then um, some dentists do their own wax up themselves uh, where they, it's basically mimicking what the end result would look like or what you want to achieve. And for me personally, I send it all to the lab and I let the lab do their thing. I tell them, look, this is what I'm trying to fix. I want to bring the teeth back because they were tilted out a little bit and bucked. So I wanted to bring them back. I wanted to redistribute the proportions. All of these things I give them very, very detailed information on. And they then send me the wax up. And then I sometimes if you're not happy with it, you can send it back and say, hey, look, I want you to kind of change a few things. Or what I do is I take photos, I take a video, or I bring the patient in and I tell them, this is what we've got. What do you think? Like, is there some something else you want to change? We have a discussion about that. Um, and I wrote possible intraoral mock-up as well. Sometimes it's really difficult for the patient to envision what it would look like in their mouth. And they might be hesitant because it's a big investment and it's, it's time in the chair. And sometimes it's a really great um, way of them being comfortable with the idea of going through with a big cosmetic case like this. So what you can do is use uh, filling material and flowable is, is the really runny filling material that we have that's really good in this case, where you can go over the teeth and give them a very temporary idea of what it may look like by filling in gaps and things like that. So um, all of that will chip off and break off within the day or, or the next day, but at least they can hold a mirror and say, oh, wow, I really like this, or I would rather it look like a little different. And you can kind of adjust expectations and things like that. Um, so that's also a good way to go about it. The second appointment, essentially from the lab, when they send the wax up, they also I also request for what's called a preparation guide and the temporary impressions. So the prep guide is that top photo in the second column. Um, based on what changes you have to make to the teeth themselves, whether you're rotating teeth or making them look a certain way and having to consider the, the thickness that the lab needs to make those changes and alterations, you need to remove more or less of the tooth structure. Um, for me, my philosophy is to be as conservative as possible in every aspect of treatments with my patients. So I love having prep guides because I don't want to be eyeballing anything. I want it to be very, very detail oriented. So I use this prep guide to check while I'm prepping and make sure that, okay, I've given the lab exactly the amount of thickness that they need and for them to achieve what we want to achieve. Because if you don't use a prep guide, you might remove too much true structure, in which case, you know, it's a detriment to the patient, but also there are, you might not remove enough tooth structure where the lab is saying, you, they might send you the case back and say, hey, I need you to get the patient back in the chair because the veneer might be too thin or it might break or fracture or compromise what we're able to achieve that we want to. Um, and then the temporary impression is basically an impression of the wax up that you're transferring into the mouth after you've prepped the teeth. So then the top image on the third column is not her specifically, because I didn't take a photo of my that it would look like. Um, and then the one on the bottom is her temporary smile. So we've transferred the wax up into the mouth. And then based on what they see there, they can tell you, oh, okay, um, I really like how this has come out, or I would like adjustments made in these areas. And then you can make those adjustments on the temporaries and alter them however they want to take another impression, send it to the lab and say, hey, we made some changes. Let's stick to this as our final goal. Um, and then just adjusting by it, making sure they're comfortable and then choosing a shade. So with choosing a shade is really important to communicate as much as possible. You're basically telling the lab you know, I want you to integrate and blend this shade into this shade at this section of the tooth, whether it's one third, two thirds, whatever it is. Um, so communication with the lab is, is very important, especially with cosmetic cases. 
Um, and then they come back for their third appointment. Once everything comes back from the lab, we remove the temporaries, we try in the permanents and then make sure that the patient is comfortable, they're happy with it, everything is as they want it to be. And we cement everything, we fine tune the bite, adjust it, make sure they're comfortable. And again, I tell them, we might see you for two, three more appointments where we're fine tuning little things here and there for it to feel completely perfect to you. And so that you're comfortable and you're using them correctly and functioning correctly as you should. And I put all of my patients who've gone through cosmetic dentistry in the night guard because we want, it's like their insurance policy on what they've invested in. I want them to have it for as long as they can and not chip anything or, you know, if they're grinding or clenching or whatever it is, we want it all to be protected. So that's a monst. And that's it. We're all done. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us and like giving us all your knowledge and sharing us with like the pre dentists. Absolutely. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know I threw a lot of information at everyone. So <laughs> there's a lot there, but yeah, that was like, it was very, very helpful. <laughs> good good wonderful so yeah I um any questions you guys have I'm happy to answer as I said I also these are my socials I've put them up here as well so if anyone wants to reach out and ask me absolutely anything I'm totally happy discussing whatever it may be um and as I said I have I have the time so feel free to reach out as well Thank you. Thank you so much. I think you pretty much answered all the questions we could have had. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, I know. I threw a lot of information out. <laughs> yeah.